Because I have been born again, because the Lord has looked down upon me in his love and kindness, because he has been benevolent, he has been a God of provisions, a God of long suffering, a God of love, a God of kindness, a God of care. Because God is a God that don't stay angry, that wants us to change, is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Because God takes no delight in the punishment, the death, and the destruction of the wicked, I have a God that I can talk to. Not only can I talk to him, but I can tell him what's on my mind, what's on my heart, and I can know within my heart that he listens, that he cares, and that he answers. It's that belief that has made us a people of God and has strengthened us as one of our spiritual blessings, one of those blessings that give us assurance, that give us peace, that give us courage, that allow us to commit ourselves to our Lord and our Savior, knowing that he has committed himself to us and has promised us, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And because God has said that I can take a whole lot, this world is going to do everything possible to separate you from your God. They're going to do everything possible to make you believe that God the promise maker is not God the promise keeper. They're going to do everything possible to make you believe that you're doing this all by yourself. When I read the word of God, God talks to me. When I get on my knees and pray, I talk to God. I had to learn something as a grown person. I had to learn humility. I had to learn thanksgiving. I had to learn that childlike faith and that God in heaven is my father. And when I learned that, life changes. Remember when we were children and I remember going to my big mama's house, that sister Mary Garrett, after Big Papa, Brother Enos Garrett, had died, my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather. And I would stay with her at night because I was somewhere first or second grade, and I would stay with her so that she would have company after the death of Big Papa. I remember before I could turn the light off in the little double bed that she had put on the other side of the wall in her bedroom for me to be there with her, that she would say, Nick, you say your prayers. And I remember getting down on my knees as a child, as a child. And I said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. Y'all remember praying that prayer? Remember how it meant so much to us to pray? And we pray for mama and daddy and the dog and the cat and everything and everybody else while we were there on our knees. Somewhere along the line, we become so anesthetized and desensitized and become so self-centered and self-reliant that that simple prayer somehow loses is profundity in our life. That God ceases to be the Father and He is someone that, like a fire extinguisher, break the glass in case of emergency or a microwave oven that we use on occasion. I said the other night, and I say it almost every sermon that I preach, God has allowed us to understand His nature. And God says, I want first place in your life. I want first place in your life. And that is the only place that God is willing to accept in our lives. And when we are men and women of prayer, when we find ourselves humble, we not only help ourselves and our family, we help desperately this nation that desperately needs Christians to send up prayers to our God, our benefactor, without whom we would not be a country today without the prayers that were sent up over 200 years ago. 
When you look at our history, when our first president, George Washington, he recognized God's hand in the building of this nation. The first president instituted the first federal day of prayer. In saying so, after he had demanded <clears throat> that he put his left hand on the Bible and raise his right hand, he said when he instituted that day of prayer, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence and almighty God to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, to humbly implore his benefits and humbly beg his protection and his favor. Isn't that something that in a nation now that seems to have put prayer away from itself has legalized <clears throat> has, has made legal a teacher not being able to pray and has said that the children cannot stand and even pray beside their beds. Benjamin Franklin was very frustrated after they had been together for over five days to rectify the Constitution. They had argued, they had fussed, they had fussed, and they had argued, and still the Constitution was not signed. This man who is often called agnostic or not involved spiritually, he stood up and he rebuked the signers of the Constitution. You want to know what Benjamin Franklin told him? He said, in the beginning, with our contest or our conflict with Great Britain, he said, we had daily prayer in this very room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, he said, and they were graciously answered. And have we now forgotten, forgotten our powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? Wow. Think about the room when Franklin is standing there saying that to a group of men when the British were looking down their throat, when their frigates and their guns were pointed in their direction and they prayed every day. Now that the war was won, Franklin said they had stopped praying. He said, I have lived long, sir. I have lived a long time, sir, and I am more and more convinced as I see this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. God does govern in the affairs of men, which is why this nation should be a praying nation. We should not neglect, we should not marginalize the fact that this nation must pray. After this, he moved that they pray every morning. They all agreed. They deliberated after prayer, and eventually the Constitution was signed. Abraham Lincoln said, the man who shepherded us through the Civil War, he says, I have been driven to my knees, to my knees. This man that saw young men bludgeoned and shot and destroyed their lives, destroyed as bodies were piled up all over the country as the country almost destroyed itself from within. He said, I've been driven to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go but to God. Would it be something, what a nation we would have if men and women today even understood that there was no where else to go but to God. I watched my father, John D. Berry Sr., John Jefferson D. Berry Sr. I watched him and men and women right there in Memphis, Tennessee. He had been to Washington in 1963 for the March on Washington. We saw Dr. King on many occasions, talk with him on many occasions, and on one occasion, <clears throat> When things were particularly violent and particularly stressing, with black men, white men, black women, white women, Jews and Gentiles, folks, a very diverse group of people that was right there in downtown Memphis, I saw them as they got on their knees, as they faced the dogs and the billy clubs and all of the stress of that day, they got on their knees 
and they prayed to God, they prayed to God, they prayed to God. The Dr. King said this prayer, help us walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until the day we all as God's children, black, white, red, yellow, will rejoice together in our one common band of brotherhood. In essence, pray. The prayers on that day calm things. I saw it like a calm came over that very moment, like a calm came over the adversaries on both sides, like a calm, the calm of God, the peace of God diffused the violence, the animosity, and the hatred. And for that moment, everybody just appealed to their God and their Father in heaven. I asked my father about it. He, I said, were well, you scared? He said, yes, I was scared. Of course I was afraid. He said, but God gave me strength. And God should give us as Christians strength as we face a world that wants to destroy us. In 1987, Ronald Reagan dedicated the National Day of Prayer saying, on this day, I ask all who believe to join with me in giving thanks to the Almighty God for the blessings he has bestowed on this land and that he affords these people. America was therefore founded on prayer, 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 prayer and petition to our God and our Father in heaven. Therefore, the removal, the removal of prayer from its public life was a central part of what we see happening today in our nation, where we see there is no sanctity in life, that unborn children are snatched from the womb, the what ought to be the safest place on earth for them. Prayer will ultimately find itself in departure of those who refuse to love their God. In 1962, they removed prayer from the school. In 1962, the Supreme Court removed all the word of God from the schools. In 1963, Bible reading was removed from the schools. No wonder that exactly 10 years later, 1973, abortion was legalized. Why? Because we turned away from our God. Solomon said in Proverbs 14 and 34 that righteousness, righteousness exalts a nation, but that sin is a reproach. It is a shame to any people. Therefore, just as prayer is important to us as a nation, Jesus gives us the example of the importance of prayer to him in his life and in the life of his disciples. Prayer was a central part in the life of Jesus. After a night of preaching, a day of preaching rather, Jesus wanted some rest. And in Mark chapter 1 and verses 35, the Bible says, In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed, the Son of God, the, a member of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We find God the Son before the Son even comes up, going somewhere and falling on his knees in prayer. In Matthew chapter 19 and verses 13, Jesus prayed for the little children. In Luke chapter 6 and verses 12, after healing a man's hand, he drove the, that drove the scribes and the Pharisees crazy because he had done it. The Bible says in verses 12, and it came to pass in those days that he went out therefore into the mountain to pray. And I want you to notice this. And the Bible says he continued all night in prayer to God. Jesus prayed all night. Can you imagine that? The Son of God on his knees and he prays to his Father all night long. John the Baptist prayed. Jesus prayed at his baptism, rather. Luke chapter 3 and verses 12. Jesus prayed 
for his disciples. He prayed for obedient unity in John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, when he said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them which shall believe on me because of their works. Then Jesus said something that they all may be one, that they may be one, that they may be one, that they may be unified. Jesus prayed for unity. The same Jesus that said, a new commandment I give you, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, not just like Moses had already said, or Jeremiah had already said, but you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus gave us a new standard. Jesus loved us when we weren't lovable, when we weren't obedient, when we didn't merit it. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus suffered and died for each and every one of us. Jesus warned Peter that Satan had desired to have him, that he might sift him like wheat. Don't you know that the devil is watching you? He's watching everything you do. This is why Paul said in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, when he was speaking to our brethren at Ephesus, when he said to them, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, to stand against the wiles of the devil. God didn't send you to invade. He didn't send you to attack. He didn't send you to subjugate. He sent you to stand. The disputed territory has already been won. The victory has already been delivered. The enemy has already been defeated. Our job as prayerful men and women of the cross, prayerful men and women of the church, is to stand, to stand, not to back up, because the Lord says, let me tell you about your battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're not fighting Leroy Bubba Cockroach and Skillet. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Prayerful people, as we are members of the Lord's church, understand that just as the devil was watching Peter, the devil is watching us. Peter learned as the Lord had prayed for him because Jesus said, I have prayed for you. And when you converted, you strengthen your brothers. I guess he was strengthened because later on in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, Peter said to every one of us as his brothers and sisters in Christ, Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be sober, be vigilant, open your eyes and understand he wants to sift you like wheat. Be sober, be vigilant because your Adversary, your opponent, like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The devil wants you to get off your knees, stop praying, stop talking to God. Someone said one time, prayer stops sin, and nothing but sin will stop prayer. Prayer was very important to our Lord. He prayed to the Father to give the disciples another comforter. In John 14 and 16, he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane with sweat and blood rolling down his face. In Matthew 26 and 29, he prayed to his father. It was not a ritual. It was not an in, uh, initiation. It was not a businessman's relationship with God. It was contrite, humble communion with his father in heaven. No wonder he gave details, instructions on how we should pray. In Matthew chapter 6, the Lord said, when you pray, I don't want you praying like a bunch of hypocrites. I don't need you sounding like those who haven't put a difference between the holy and the profane. He said, when you pray, you go somewhere in your closet, you find a private place 
and you pray. He says, basically, those that want to be seen and those that want to be heard, when they've been seen and when they've been heard, God don't owe them anything because they've already gotten what they wanted. In Luke chapter 18 and verses 10 through verses 13, he said, two men went down to the temple to pray. They are in the place of God to pray. One of them walks in with his head hanging high, styling and smiling and profiling, standing before his God, thanking God for his piety and his greatness and his learning and his accomplishments and his purity and how he has kept the law perfectly. Sounds like the rich young ruler when he asked the Lord, what do I do? And the Lord said, basically keep the law. He said, I've been doing that all of my life. How many of us from time to time lose sight that no matter what you know, God knows more. What you've done, God's done more. Whatever your power and abilities are, they were given to you by God. Therefore, we remain humble, humble. We don't ever have any great accomplishment to report to God. We come to God with humility and love. He said, the publican, he didn't even raise his eyes. He lowered his eyes and just said, God, will you have mercy on me, a sinner? Will you just have mercy on me, a sinner? What was the last time you just prayed? You didn't go through your grocery list, didn't talk about what you needed, didn't tell God about what you did, who said something to you. What was the last time you just said, God, will you just have mercy on me? Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Abba, Father, I need thee, I need thee, oh, I need thee. And when we think about this, what the Lord is trying to show us is his own heart. Prayer is not self-exaltation. Prayer is not lifting up oneself because all souls belong to God. When we think about this in the book of Luke 23, 42, is an example of a prayer, but his humility. In those days, the Bible lets me know that, that, that there came, there was a man that hanged on the cross. Jesus is in the middle. I want you to, to imagine this. There's a thief on the right side. There's a thief on the left side. You've got the Son of God in the middle. You've got both men communicating back and forth with the Lord, but you got one man in his arrogance and self-deceit says, if you're the son of God, if you really who you said you are. How many folks don't really say it, but it's in their mind? The Bible said the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He didn't say the fool said it with his mouth. He said he's saying it with a sincerity. He's saying it with his faith. He's saying it with his assurance that there is no God. I say that many of us are practical atheists. It's not that we don't believe that there is a God. We just live like there is no God. And so you've got this thief on one side saying, if you're the son of God, why don't you save yourself and us? And you've got another man on the other side who rebukes him, rebukes him. And you know what Jesus says to this man? He says to him, this night thou shalt be with me in paradise. Folks say because of his petition and his prayer, that translates to us today. So all we got to do is pray and go to heaven. But I want you to think about something, about why that man was saved. His humility and his repentance and his acceptance of Jesus as the Messiah was exactly what he was supposed to do at that juncture in history. That's exactly what John the Baptist had been preaching. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why was the thief saved? Why was he saved? He was saved because he repented, he was humble, and he did exactly what John the Baptist was telling everybody else to do. But Jesus was not finished at that particular time. 
a little bit later on, <clears throat> the Bible tells me that in Luke chapter 23 and verses 46, that Jesus says to the Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. In essence, later on in John 19 and verses 30, before he said that, Jesus said, it is finished. Now is finished. What the thief had done on the cross is finished. What John the Baptist had been preaching is finished. The thief did exactly what he was supposed to do to receive forgiveness. He was humbled and he repented and he died in the Lord's favor. He had promised, God had promised, Jesus had promised to send another comforter. In the book of John 16 through verses 19, he will send another comforter that will abide <clears throat> with them forever. So now we got someone that's going to tell us now that Jesus is dead, now that Jesus has risen from the dead and said all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me, how do you go to heaven? In Acts chapter 2 and verses 1, the Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house wherein they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it is set upon each of them. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Bible tells me Pathians and Medes and Eliamites, brothers of Mesopotamia, those of Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Egypt, Cyrene, and strangers about Rome, Jews and proselytes. Somebody said, these boys drunk. These boys are drunk of some new wine. Peter said, these men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. A little bit later in verses 23, Peter said to them, ye men of Israel, you hear these words because you need to understand which side of the cross you are on. You hear these words. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, you. Can you see Peter looking at them with white hot eyes like a prosecutor who is convicting a guilty felon? You have your wicked hands crucified and slain, whom God have raised up, having loosed the pangs of death, for it was not possible for him to be holy. Because of time, let's move on down. Because when the Bible says they, that, 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 that they were pricked in their hearts, and they cried out and said, men, brethren, what in the world can we do? What can we do? We killed the Son of God. How do we get ourselves saved after such a terrible sin? Did he tell them to fall down and pray? Did he tell them to sing a song? Did he tell them to do a good giving, a good time? Did he tell them to quote a few scriptures? No. The Bible tells me that he said to them, repent, be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus. Why, why Peter? For the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Notice, they ask, what must we do? And they were told to repent. In Acts chapter 9, there was a man who was threatening slaughter to God's people. He was a mean, hungry, arrogant, bloodthirsty man by the name of Saul of Tarshish. He was threatening God's people. Had gone and gotten papers to go to Damascus and slaughter some more, imprison some more, and Christians were doing the best they could to hold on to the faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is not a nice guy. God knocked him down blind. Knocked him down blind. And the Bible says he was led on into the city. And he was told, I will send somebody to tell you what you must do. Remember, God placed this truth in earthen vessels. Jesus could have preached the sermon from heaven. 
Jesus could have told him right there, but that's not his job anymore. He went and sat on the right hand of God. He inspired the scriptures. He filled the apostles with the Holy Ghost. It is their job to tell him. The Bible lets me know that they sent the Ananias down there and Ananias didn't want to go. I've heard some stuff about this boy, Lord. He's mean. He said, you go tell him what he must do. And when he went down and preached, the Bible lets me know in verse 9 and verse 11, this boy had been praying three days. If a man could be saved by prayer alone, Saul of Tarsus should have been saved. But when the preacher got there, he didn't say, have you prayed? No, he didn't say, have you told God about your sins? No, he says, arise, arise. You get your blind self up. And when he got up, the scales fell off his eyes, and the Bible says he was baptized. The eunuch said, see, here is water. He'd been asked, do you understand? He said, I can't let you teach me. But when he got taught, he said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? You find the same with Cornelius, the same with the Philippian jailer, the same with the centurion. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. God say, no, that's not the way you are saved, just by praying for grace. He said, how can you which are dead to sin live any longer therein? Paul said in Titus 2, 11 and 12, that the grace of God, notice what he said, that bring it salvation has appeared unto all men. Doing what, Paul? Teaching us. What, Paul? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, you should live soberly, responsibility to self, righteously, responsibility to brothers, godly, responsibility to God in this present world. In other words, the grace that God gives is wrapped up in the teaching. If you're going to find the grace, you're going to find the teaching. When you find the teaching, you find the grace. Can you pray to have your way to heaven? No, you got to be obedient. Can you sing your way to heaven? No. Can you give your way to heaven? No. Can you preach your way to heaven? No. Can you quote scriptures your way to heaven? No. You've got to turn to the image of your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ. Heaven is going to be populated by people who look like Jesus, by people who sound like Jesus, by people who live like Jesus. When God looked at that middle cross, when he looked at that middle cross, he saw a thief on the right and a thief on the left. And in the middle, all that middle cross, he saw you and 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 me because he's our propitiation our substitute jesus didn't just die for my sins jesus died in my place and just as he looked at that middle cross and he saw us when he says to jesus go get my children go get my children and when Jesus comes back to this earth, just as God looked at that cross and he saw us, when he looks at us, he better see Jesus or you will not be going to heaven.